I'm Jake. I'm Tom. And we are Velocities and Music on this podcast. My friend Tom Hummer and I discuss a canon of topics Ooh. pertaining to modern music, including artist deep dives and monthly and annual new music wrap-ups. Better late than never, today we are going to give our abbreviated thoughts on albums released in October 2016. Before we get started, you can help support Velocities in Music. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting device to automatically get our podcast episodes sent to your device about twice a month when we release them. Mm -hmm. Also, Velocities in Music doesn't want your money. We also don't want to introduce ads into this podcast just yet. Right now, all we want is for you to share Velocities in Music with family or friends whom you think would benefit in on joining in on the music discussion Tom and I try to create each week. So, yeah, my friend Tom. Yes. That's you. That's me. I was referring to that friend. <laughs> this one? The one sitting across from me. Okay. Lots of music came out in October. Dude, it's, it was jam-packed. It's like the music industry looked at the amount of albums that they wanted to release, maybe even the numbers for record sales that they wanted to hit for the year, and said, oh... Well, I guess we can't release albums in November and December, so October it is. October's our last chance. Yeah, October's the last chance to get in on that sweet, sweet 2016 sales. <laughs> I guess. That's a really cynical way of looking at it. it. But but I also, you know, but, have I also have an accounting degree. I went to business school. Like yeah. I can't help but think of the world in these terms, Tom. I yeah, can't help it. It's true. Well, November and December always slump in album releases. Anyway. Yeah. There's always like one or two albums that come out in December that are like awesome. And then there's just nothing else. Like last year it was Baroness, if you remember. They came out with purple like first or second week of December. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. And I don't know if anything else came out right. the whole damn month. Right. Sorry, Hillary Clinton just texted me. Oh, did she? She wants me to vote for her tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow's voting day. I, little... bet, I bet it was a mass text. She doesn't even care about you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to admit, like, so many, so many volunteer folk have come to my door yeah. and, knocked on, and, and, and had a conversation with me about stuff, and I always, like, feel obligated to talk to these, to yeah. these people because they're so motivated and I, and I like desperately want to just glean just just a sliver of their motivation for, for anything <laughs> in my life that's not like my family or music it's or like, you care enough to go to strangers doors door for to door free door to door like and do that and like every time I open the door I'm clearly annoyed I yeah. was watching the Green Bay Packers. You're not surprised. Green Bay uh, yeah. Packers suffered yeah. a horrible loss at home to the Indianapolis oh, did Colts. They? It was it was awful. I mean, yeah, of course they I, did. I was frustrated to boot, and yeah. then this Hillary supporter during the game comes <laughs> on the door, and I'm I'm like head to toe Packers gear, and like I must have just had this like get off my lawn look <laughs> on my face. Were you she just were you she holding just, a broom? <laughs> <laughs> I I might as well have been. She kind of just cowered there. She's like. Hi, <laughs> and I felt so bad because I'm like I already voted, and and then I, she didn't get to do her whole her whole spiel. But the moral of all this is tomorrow's election day. Yeah. I'm really sick of hearing all the it is. the 2016. By the time we post this, it'll it'll be, it'll be yeah. we'll know yeah. who's pre President Trump will be <laughs> on his altar of unforgiveness, <laughs> it, 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 and the world will be great. The America will be great again. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm cynical tonight. Um, <laughs> the point of all of that was to admit that this is rather late for our October yes. wrap up. And, and we realized that, and you know, I, I am I like, I have a personal goal that we need to do a better job of being closer to the actual end of the month. Well, it also just depends on what day of the month last Friday falls. R right. And honestly, like our schedules too. like yeah. the day of the month has to align and then our oh, schedules yeah. have well, to work I was, out. I was the dick last week cause I was you busy like the dick. two nights. Nights that you could have You're not recorded. a dick for having a life. Mm. Enjoy your life. Enjoy it. As I hope you guys do, listening to Velocities of Music, yeah. where we give you updates on new music, artists, whatever my spiel is at the beginning of this <laughs> thing that I should have memorized but don't, and I read from a Google Doc. So speaking of which, Tom, yeah. a lot of music came out. Oh, we should God. talk about that music. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's dive right in. Okay. All right, so we're starting October with an album that came out near the beginning of October that we had really been looking forward to, Fantagram's third album, Three. Uh, it's a good, it's a good name, named, right? Aptly named. 
Jake and I are big Fantagram fans. Uh, I think that they're they're one of the best newer bands out there today. They haven't put out anything bad. I think three continues that. I'll say up front that I still liked Eyelid movies and voices better than this one. Yeah, this is my third uh, favorite. Yeah, but I don't think that it's a disappointment in any way. Sure. Uh, this band actually always takes a while to grow on me. So a- after a few listens, you know, there's still several tracks that. At first, I didn't really like all that much, but then they grew on me. This sound is certainly poppier, but to me, not in a way that compromises the positive songwriting and production qualities that their music has always had. Uh, in fact, one, one track I want to call out is right in the middle of the album. Uh, there's a track called Barking Dog, which this track actually addresses uh, Sarah, the, the lead female vocalist, her sister's suicide which is a very dark moment in, in the band's life. Sarah and Josh are close friends uh, that really impacted the music. You listen to that song, and there's not really a pop structure. There's not really a pop melody. It's just this kind of meandering, looping um, mood piece. And it's mm-hmm. very effective. And like when I got to that track, I thought to myself, you know, despite all the bigger beats and flashier vocals, this song is not something that a band does when they're only concerned with pop radio success. Right. They're maintaining their artistry, and I respect that a lot. Yeah, they, they obviously show some diversity, too. Like, they could do a lot more mm-hmm. than what they're actually doing on this album. Uh, don't get me wrong. There's a number of just fantastic tracks on yeah. three. Like, it, just some of my favorite songs of the year are on this record. But I also think that there's some that just aren't quite at that level. So the yeah. album comes off kind of feeling a little inconsistent to me as a straight-through listen. It's more of a compilation of Fantagram songs, whereas I definitely feel that Eyelid movies, and to some extent voices, were much more album listening experiences. Three's not that, but I still think that this is a solid record, and I was really pleased with it. Following Fantagram, we have Hiss, Golden Messenger. Sibilance. Sibilance. Sorry, Carl. <laughs> no idea what that was about. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's the hiss sound. The S sound. Sibilance. Sibilance. Okay. okay. It's a... It's a okay. I don't know. Audio, I, audio guy joke. Yeah. Like, I'm, obviously, I'm not that, so... <laughs> That wasn't funny to me, but a couple a couple people out there might find totally, that really funny. Totally disruptive. No, I think I, I think I think you're onto something here. You obviously have a you know a, a good career in comedy ahead. If music <laughs> doesn't work out for you, or music reviewing. <laughs> All right, Hiss Golden Messenger, Heart Like a Levy. That's the name of the album by Hiss Golden Messenger, and this is indie folk rock. The thing that makes this album work for me is entirely the vocals. Mm -hmm. They're not the typical country rock vocals. They're higher pitched and pair oddly with the instrumentals, making you forget that this is a genre that has been done countless times. To me, this certainly is not a bad record. The performances here are squarely within that folk, indie folk genre, uh, but it may as well be all covers. I don't really feel any sense of a signature to the sound. Next up, we've got Connor O'Burst's album, Ruminations. Uh, you, you may remember from a couple years ago, Jake and I reviewed Upside Down Mountain. We were not fans of it. Oh. We were not fans of oh, it. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> what, you've been trying to forget that one? <laughs> <laughs> really hard. <laughs> right. So this this album actually makes me realize that Connor O'Burst is at his best when he strips away the, the BS and keeps the arrangement simple. This is just a piano, guitar, harmonica, and vocals album. That's it. And the performances are very good. Still, you know, the songwriting doesn't really pull me in all that much. That's just something I, I feel about all, all of Conor O'Burr's stuff, uh, even his work with as as Bright Eyes or with Bright Eyes. Uh, I've never been a huge fan. Um, but a, a lot of it is actually the lyrics. He's known as a great lyricist, but O'Burr's lyrics always create a wall between me and him. They're usually personal or narrative in a way that I don't necessarily find relatable, so I don't become vested in what he's saying. 
While the simplified sound here is really great, in a way it backfires even a bit because it makes the lyrics all the more important, and while I actually find the lyrics here better than some of his past work, there's nothing else to grasp onto, so sometimes I just find myself caring, and sometimes I don't. It was a little hit or miss, but, but compared to his other work, I actually liked it quite a bit, and I like the honesty. Turn them in style, twirl around the room, curtsy and smile, and they sit at his feet. Read poetry and swoon with each word he speaks. Following Ruminations by Connor Oberst, we have Dee Dee Dumbo's Utopia Defeated. This really has an indie singer-songwriter feel, but with very polished and complex arrangements. The vocals even conjure an adolescent indie love child of Sting, And Jeff Buckley. Tom wrote that. And I I think that it's just evocative and excellent. So I get a big Alt-J vibe from this. And and I think that's a very good thing. Utopia Defeated Sound is centered around the vocals, which which are similar to me, to to Grizzly Bear and the Antlers and austere uh, male vocals that ring out. Uh, with quite an emotional depth. The music backing the vocal presentation is tactfully minimalistic, focusing on key sonic ideas and using them to provide structure to the melody over the beat. You hear keys, soft synths, guitar, and other electronic effects, all over simplistic, grounded beats. The song structuring here creates unpredictability and fluidness to the listen. These tracks are really, really allowed to explore their turf, but always are just a hop away from a familiar chorus. I'm really, really digging this record. Next up, we have an album from Kate Tempest, Let Them Eat Chaos. Kate Tempest is kind of an experimental uh, British hip-hop artist and she is all about the lyrics. She's actually uh, has a, has like a poetry background, so you'll definitely get that from the lyrics here. Uh, there's a lot to love about just the mood and the vibe of the album. It has a very authentic feel. The beats remind me a little bit of Gorillaz, and Kate's vocal delivery is tense. It has this anxiety to it, uh, but but really, it all centers around the lyrics, right? Uh, they're very socially and politically minded, and the writing and performance is extremely strong. I honestly don't know why there isn't more music like this. Mm-hmm. I, I really loved it. Hell, maybe there is, and I'm just ignorant to it, so if people out there know stuff like Kate Tim, this, let me know. My only complaint about this album is that it maybe feels about five to ten minutes too long for how similar the tracks tend to be. Um, but I was just loving this. I, I I think it was a really strong effort. Hostile, worried, lonely. We move in our packs, and these are the rights we were born to. Working and working so we can be all that we want, and dancing the drudgery off. But even the drugs have got boring. Well, sex is still good when you get it. For a different turn now, we're gonna go to Goat's new record. Requiem. Goat is a Swedish experimental psychedelic kind of noise rock, like world Afrobeat sort of sort of artist. You said a lot of um, things. Just a lot of lot of things, <laughs> and that kind of describes their sound. It's a yeah. lot of things. Oh, definitely. You hear, you hear a lot of things. So this is, you know, Requiem is you got these psychedelic cult like jams, then have a strong Eastern influence. This could have this could have come straight out of the 60s, although for that time it still would have been a little out there. Uh, as it incorporates some of the primal hypnosis of kraut rock, albeit with more orga- organic instrumentation. This is very well performed uh, and is just really fun to listen to, although it runs a little bit long. Next up, we've got Nora Jones' new album, Daybreaks. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a Nora Jones mega fan or anything. I haven't listened to too much of her stuff. But god damn, I'm a sucker for some chunky double bass. And that is all over this album. This album sounds great. And by, by this point, you know, Nora knows exactly how to use her voice to fit that mellow, jazzy style. I even think she does a good job of mixing some tempo and dynamic variety into what can often be a very pigeonholed and bland genre. This still doesn't do a ton for me, but there are a few great tracks on here and none that piss me off, so really it's a nice album to have on. Hope you find a way to make it through Cause it keeps running my heart Rain 
Next, we have Shovels and Rope with their album Little Seeds. Shovels and Rope, this is my first exposure to them. They are a South Carolina-based folk, American folk duo uh, featuring, I, w- I would say, fairly talented male and female vocalists. Um, <clears throat> let's just cut right to it. Little Seeds, this is very authentic indie folk music, blending aspects of alt country and Americana, featuring the dueling male and female vocals I just described. I'd consider this hometown folk music. It feels mm-hmm. familiar and comfortable while still being able to capture the gamut of emotions of day-to-day life. On most tracks, the core of this sound is built around acoustic and electric guitar playing in unison underneath the male and female vocals belting out in unison. This record has a lot of personal appeal to it, which is what folk music is really all about. I'll give them credit for great execution. Where I get a little bummed out is in the lack of originality. They simply don't do enough to make this sound their own, nor do they do enough to make any of these tracks significantly stand out on the album, with the exception of maybe the closing track, The Ride. I like this record as a genuinely solid indie folk off- indie folk offering for 2016. It's not that fantastic on its own. Fish came out with a new album in October, Big Boat. And historically, I am a Fish fan. uh, And this album just bored the hell out of me. It was long. There was, there was no fire under it, no fuego, if you will. And by the time I was done listening to it, I had completely forgotten that the last hour of my life had even happened. I, I really don't have much good to say about this album. All right, we're going to give you a double header of crap albums here. Oh, Dookie? Uh, <laughs> no, no, but a different Green Day oh. album, Revolution Radio. Uh, Jake Jake doesn't even want to comment on this because he doesn't like Green Day anyway. I, I, um, I purposely avoided listening to this record. And, and you should have. And Tom, Tom is a little surprised it wasn't very good. Uh, no, it, it was so bad. I, I don't even remember it because all my notes that I wrote is just the word no five times. <laughs> It was just that bad. Like, like I can't think of anything good to say about this. It, it Revolution Radio. I mean, the radio part is definitely strong. It sounds like crap radio garbage two-minute radio hits, um, but they're not good enough to be hits. Uh, and there's no revolution behind it. There's really no energy here. There's nothing that they're trying to accomplish. It, it just feels like a cop-out to me. I really hated this record. Following that steaming pile of garbage, <laughs> we have Julia Jacqueline with her album Don't Let the Kids Win. Julia Jacqueline is a uh, Australian, Sydney, Australia singer songwriter, which mm. that's cool. You know, yeah. how many Australian artists do we review and or, or talk about in a year? I'm not I, think sure. that, I think that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it's reading about Julia Jacqueline, she gets. Uh, folk comparisons but like i hear a lot of like art pop and and singer songwriter Mm -hmm. in this um i I gotta be honest i'm loving this style of tranquil washy female singer songwriter with a mix of hazy 60s surf rock and indie country it's weird but it works as it comes off extremely authentic and enduring so don't let the kids win has a really great sound i'm concerned that the songwriting isn't nearly as strong as some of the other artists operating in this sonic space like sharon van etten these songs are relatively simple ideas focusing on tactile execution over big dynamic shifts i could see myself liking this more with subsequent listens because there's a lot of subtlety here but overall i was i just thought it was decent Now we have the new Kings of Leon album, Walls. 
All caps. That's why I said it rather loudly there. So Kings of Leon, to me, they feel like they've gotten some of their energy back with this album. I wasn't a huge fan of their last couple releases, um, <clears throat> but but to me, they desperately need to ditch this reverbed out arena rock sound if they ever want to be interesting or respectable again. I just don't feel like I can really call this album bad, though, uh, despite that being kind of a harsh criticism. It may be actually better than their last couple. I still still hold that to be true, but it just doesn't do anything to set itself apart from other rock that's coming out. This also has to have one of the worst album covers I've ever seen. I don't I don't know if you agree with that, Jake. It's like like weird cartoonish versions of their faces, like like floating halfway out of a weird pool of Elmer's glue or something. I don't know. I don't get it. It's weird. It freaks me out. You're just not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't remember the album cover. Okay. Well, just take my word for it. The <laughs> Elmer's Glue, though. That's in- that's interesting. Okay. All right. Following Kings of Leon and their walls, we have The Orb with Cow. Or chill out world, but with I like the next that. chill out world, like yeah. with an exclamation point. Yeah, they're excited about Come on, chilling guys. out. Yeah, and that makes sense. These guys are known for being one of the founders of ambient electronica, which is pretty awesome. If I'm gonna say so myself, mm-hmm. I've loved me some ambient electronica over the years. So sure, uh, I was excited to listen to this record. In in my opinion, with chill out world or cow, any ambient electronica that actually achieves creating the feeling and mood of a soundtrack is a mark of a quality record in this genre. Cow fits that bill. And even though a million other artists, it's probably an exaggeration, have come along and tried to steal the sound or or make their own version of this sound, probably Mm -hmm. not as well as these guys have proven they can do. Uh, Even though that trope is a little tired and overused, this still is a really quality listen. Next up, we've got Sweatshop Boys and their album, Kashmir. Uh, this this has Hemes from Das Racist, if you're familiar with Hemes. Uh, I remember when Das Racist was around several years ago. They were doing some pretty cool stuff, so it's cool to see him back into I it. I still look for combination Pizza Huts and Taco Bells. Just so you can say, just so you can text me where you at, dog. I'm on, I'm on Jamaica Avenue. I, I actually, so quick tangent, this is actually a true story. Anytime I do see a combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell, I take a picture of it and I text it to Jake with the caption, yes. where you at, dog? Yes, you, you, you have to do that. I do that. Yeah, it's it's like a responsibility. Yeah, it's yeah. an obligation. No, it's a social contract. <laughs> it really is. So anyway, uh, so yes, Heems from Das Racist, Sweatshop Boys, <clears throat> his new group. So this is a really interesting take on hip hop. This is really unique. The use of Eastern sounds that they're using here in this genre is really cool. It makes for a a, at least unique in Western American culture sound. Maybe some other folks are doing it that I'm just ignorant to due to my location. Uh, So I really like that aspect of it. The lyrics to me though are a bit spotty. At times they're very culturally pertinent and sharp and sometimes they just feel juvenile and shallow. Unfortunately, what really holds this back for me is that the actual rapping style sounds a little harsh in a really forced way. They're trying to artificially inject edge into the performance, and to me, it undermines their persona and credibility. I think this would have been much better if they went for a smoother delivery, and it would have fit the background of the beats and the music that was going on. She said, I'm a slut, I'm a hoe, I'm a freak. She said, I got a different girl every day of the week. She said, she called the cops on me, cause I get in them streets. She said that I ain't shit. She said I passed my Next up, we have an album called Game Show, which is the third record from Irish group Two Door Cinema Club. So, let's get right to it, Tom. Mm -hmm. Originality is the most important factor to me when I am considering an album. Game Show has none of it. This is a meaningful helping of the blandest recipe on the box of disco-influenced pop rock Circa artists such as Phoenix and Passion Pit. The sound is inherently catchy due to the 
repeated beats, bright synth and guitar melodies, and vanilla yet hook-infused vocals. Honestly, though, I ha- I just full disclosure, for what Two Door Cinema Club is going for, they probably crushed it on this record. This just is so far from my cup of tea that I can't, in good faith, say that this is a good record. Next, we have the second album from the early years, aptly named, once again, Two. The early years. This is actually the later years of the early years. Mm. They're a band whose debut album actually came out a decade ago. They haven't done a whole lot since, so they're getting back into it. This is kind of spacey British rock along the lines of, I would say, like spiritualized or the horrors. If you're into those bands, you know, not exactly like that, but you get the direction I'm going. But this has much more of an 80s vibe along the lines of Joy Division or New Order mixed with some kraut rock. The grooves here are great. The bass and drums really hold them down well, while thick synths come and just complete the ride. Uh, This was well executed, and and I love the genre they're going for, but it's not overly original. It's enjoyable, but not a truly inspirational experience. Next up, we have C. Duncan. Scottish electronic composer, dream pop, other genres in in that nature. Chill wave. Yeah, yeah. His new album is called The Midnight Sun. Mm, The Midnight Mm. Sun. You'd think he lived in Alaska or something. Don't think too hard about that. You you might have to, but no, it's uh, Scotland. Uh, Thomas, I just said. Um, The first track on The Midnight Sun is very strong. However, this album has a nice meandering flow to it. It reminds me of Beach House with more airy, harmonized vocals. The slow, lethargic crawl of this album could put you to sleep in the wrong context, but I actually found the moodiness of this record to be quite enjoyable. Yeah, I think you enjoy this one quite a bit more than me. I thought what started as a very interesting album here ended up drifting just into this lukewarm chill wave. That's not a terrible thing. I'm not trying to trash the genre, but about halfway through the album, I felt like nothing I'd heard really lived up to the first track, and there wasn't enough variety to excuse that disparity in quality. Uh, I think he nails the sound. The aesthetic is great, but overall, the lack of dynamics and variety made this album feel a lot longer than it was. Next up, we had a new album from metal classic act, the Dillinger Escape Plan, Dissociation. This is a band I really like. They they just don't put out bad material. And while Dissociation is far from bad, I also think it's far from their best work. I prefer their last couple records over this one. It's still just as hard-hitting and intense as you would want, but it just feels less purposeful and focused to me. Still though, if you're just if you're looking for good metal, I I would definitely check these guys out if you haven't checked them out before. Tom, you remember how just a second ago I was like, how often do we get a review talk or talk about artists from Sydney, Australia? I, or, I, or Australia in general. I do but, remember that. Let alone Sydney. Yeah. Well, we have another one. Yeah. And I didn't know this. I actually did not know that Jaguar Ma is from Sydney, Australia. Interesting. How would you classify Jaguar Ma just off the top of your head? I would say that they're, they've are they got this kind of throwback 90s dance sound. It, it, it's, it takes from a lot of British artists, actually. Primal Scream, Chemical Brothers, Basement Jacks, stuff like that. Yeah, and while, you know, their their new album, by the way, is called Every Now and Then, and, and, and while the style is still very similar to their debut, which I remember liking pretty yeah. well, it's not nearly as good in a quality sense as that as their debut. The tracks here are, they just drone on for unjustified lengths, with very little evolving within the tracks enough to maintain the listener's interest, or my interest, there was an infectious, melodic, and tactful element to Howland that's just not present here. Kind 
coming off of our somewhat recent Ween deep dive, we were yeah. treated with a new album from the Dean Ween group. Of course, primarily Dean from Ween, Dean Ween. Uh, and this is called the Deaner album, which I love. Uh, there's some stuff on here that will give you all the classic Ween feels. And to that point, this is a really enjoyable album. It's also a little long, though, and has several tracks that just feel like Deaner noodling on guitar rather than any kind of thought-out composition. Overall, any Ween fan will like this, but I don't see it having a lot of comeback quality outside of a few tracks. After the Dean Ween group, we have Katie Gately with her record Color. This is in the genre of female electronica slash art rock, and I find this really fascinating. You know, other artists in this genre, Holly Herndon, Julia Holter, Jenny Hival, Juliana Barwick, yeah. and Glasser. There's just, I tell you, this is the year for interesting yeah. female solo artists doing some kind of electronica or art rock or or even chamber music. Like, I love this this combination of genres that we're seeing here. Yeah, and color certainly impressed me on first listen. Certainly classifiable as electronica and art rock. This is straight up Bjork influence. You have tons of electronic textures and melodies varying in presentation and production. Big beats, Katie Gately's vocals belt out powerfully over the chaos, creating a space-age soundscape that I found to be engaging and overflowing with ideas. The last few tracks on this album venture further into the obscure and meander quite a bit more, and this makes the album feel a little bit front heavy for my taste, but overall I thought this was a really strong record and, I gotta say, great, great album cover. So, you know, I was saying just now, Jake, that this seems to be the year for these really artistic, awesome female solo artists, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, Another thing it's the year for is throwback, emo, pop punk kind of sounds. Yep. And that's what we yep. have on this two, album. Two ends of the spectrum, really. <laughs> right. Trophy Eyes with their album Chemical Miracle. This album, putting it on, just made me ask, is it 2016 or 2006? Because that's Tom, when this would have fit. 2016. Thanks, Jake. Thank you for that that reminder. Yep. That's what this harkens back to, though. But more of the pop punk side of things that were coming out in the aughts, like Brand New, Taking Back Sunday, even like Some 41, which I'm not a big fan of, but it takes some of those qualities and spins it in a more positive uh, and authentic way. Where they maintain that authenticity is in the lack of pop presentation. The production doesn't have the sheen that this genre did when it started dominating pop radio, and it focuses more on capturing an energy than being catchy. I don't think these guys are doing anything really relatively new, but they really sell it here. Following Trophy Eyes, we have an album called These Systems Are Failing by Moby. Moby and the Void Pacific yes. Choir. We should note that, but, yes. but Moby and, and the Void Pacific Choir. Yeah, and the Void Pacific Choir. They're on it. Yep, they're mm -hmm. on it. This sounds closer to Moby's album Animal Rights than anything he's done recently. And that album was famously polarizing, earning near universal hate from critics, but support from select high profile celebrities. I didn't find this as disappointing as some people all apparently have, but mm -hmm. I also didn't really love it here. In general, it's nice to hear that Moby is mixing it up a bit and making music that is more aggressive and even vocal based. Next up, we have Sid Arthur with her album, Apricity. 
This has a really smooth, pleasing sound. It's based in psychedelic rock, but not in a meandering jam band kind of way, in a very focused way that's rooted in tight songwriting. They try hard to create tension and intrigue in the writing, but for me, this is where the smoothness of the production actually backfires, as it's too polished, uh, and the vocalist is too mid-dynamic and pretty to create any real tension. He's got this smooth, buttery voice that kind of sounds becoming of a pop star, yet without any of the flamboyance. So th they kind of seem to try to make every song an experience on this album, uh, but then it kind of just ends up being these these spacey jams that flow in and out of the song structures. So, you know, it, it's an interesting listen. For that reason, I will say that it's, it's kind of an intriguing album, but overall it just kind of washed over me as being mild. Next, we have an album called Yes Laud from NX Worries. This is a hip hop record similar to Anderson Pock's album from earlier this year. Mm -hmm. I He's in the group. Yeah, yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, I really like this style. It's it's well executed with very smooth productions uh, and and tracks that are pretty short in length that you know almost makes them feel more like vignettes. Um, the shorter track lengths here to me make this album feel a lot more fluid than it would have otherwise otherwise they never let an idea go completely stale and this kind of purposeful songwriting leads to a well-structured album listening experience i love the beats on this record and the production everything sounds tactful and professional nothing gaudy this gives the album style and class something that i think hip-hop desperately needs more of nowadays See, I think that it, the short track lengths actually had the opposite effect on me, Jake. Mm. Uh, whereas you you liked that a lot. I, you liked this album a lot more than I did. Uh, the short tracks for me, while that's not inherently bad, it, it, it made it so these songs never really set up a groove. And it's trying really hard to groove. Uh, so for me, it was just a little too kind of ADD jumping all over the place to, to really get me hooked. And I want to keep peace. It's so hard. It's only as hard as you think. No Next, we have a new album from Pretenders, classic band. This one's called Alone. For this one, Chrissy Hind teamed up with Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys, Auerbach, Auerbach, whatever. And they actually make quite the team in reviving this group. Uh, Chrissy's vocals still sound great, and the songs on the whole are pretty darn good. I don't think this album goes above and beyond in scope, though, but it does provide that good old-fashioned rock and roll sound, just proving that it ain't dead yet. Following Pretenders, we have Agnes Obel? Obel? Uh, one of the two. Danish singer-songwriter with her album Citizen of Glass. And I would describe this as orchestral chamber music kind of feel to the sound. Um, the sound is built around plucked strings, sometimes in multiple layers, piano, and occasional subtle acoustic beats crafted from like light tapping and clicks. Uh, the vocals are are what you would expect from an artist in in this genre. They're they're very lush yet airy and austere. I can tell that Citizen of Glass is intended to pull pull at your heartstrings, but I gotta say, Agnes Obel or Obel or however you say that name, I hate being from Iowa and not knowing how to understand. <laughs> Hopefully, people don't confuse her with all the other millions of Agnes yeah, artists that are out yeah. there. Yeah, Agnes is my grandma's name. Really? Did you know that? Oh. Yeah. Is she a musician? Uh, she's not, but I call her Boo Boo. All right. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, but, but, uh, you know, I was saying that, that this was intended to pull at your heartstrings mm -hmm. as my, you know, that's when I mentioned my grandma. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> but it, she never really sets up the required warrant to really pull you in and make you feel it. So I, I feel like this, this, while I really like the sound and the presentation of this record, I never really felt that emotional connection that made me fall in love with it. To the day Next up, we've got another 
female solo artist, Weighs Blood. The album's called Front Row Seat to Earth. Mm -hmm. So this, compared to some of the other artists we've talked about tonight, though, this has more of a pastoral kind of 60s, 70s singer-songwriter vibe along the lines in some ways of like Joni Mitchell or Carole King, but without the poppy production. Uh, She writes songs that focus on vocal melody, but it's not really presented in a way that's trying to be poppy or infectious. Yeah, I really wouldn't call this anything near art rock, Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think you're spot on calling this pastoral 60s 70s pop the basic sonic foundation here is piano and drums with some uh midi filler strings and choral singing i actually don't know if it's midi or not tom i'll let you make that call um and and that's all under uh female vocals which dominate the mix uh front row seat to earth was even produced to sound like it came out of the late 60s and in my opinion that's not a good thing the lack of production quality actually prevents some of the good things going on in the songwriting from adding to the necessary intensity builds via dynamic contrast you know that just never occurs and and so these kind of feel flat at times What's worse is that Weyas Blood's vocals are almost always at exactly the same volume, making this feel lobotomized. This is a frustrating listening experience because I hear so much potential here, but it's held back by some basic, basic songwriting issues. Next, we have the radio department with Running Out of Love. This is electronica and dance reminiscent of Hot Chip in in their more recent years. The mood here is somewhat dark and brooding caused by the morose synth melodies and vocal presentation. The production is engineered to sound hollow and sterile, and they pulled that they pulled off what they are going for. However, it's a fairly common style nowadays. Next up, we've got Leonard Cohen's new album, You Want It Darker. Great Leonard Cohen album title, just classic. So I like this much better than his last couple. Uh, It's more focused, and it comes off as less silly. Now, let me just say... I know that silly is something that Leonard Cohen never really strives to be, but for me, he comes off that way a lot of the time. Like, he's so over-the-top morose that that sometimes it feels more like a caricature. Uh, and I think a lot of Leonard Cohen fans would bite my head off for saying that, uh, but, but that's just how I interpret it. That's how it feels to me. Still, I feel like this album is really mostly for those fans who've been along for the ride with Leonard long enough for this somewhat dark farewell of an album to have a strong impact. For me, I'm not quite feeling that as deeply, but I still think it's a very good album. You don't need a lawyer. I'm not making a claim. You don't need to surrender. You may be surprised to learn that the American rock band Jimmy Eat World is still producing albums. Mm. Their latest, their ninth studio record, Integrity Blues, came out in October. And I gotta say, while I was a big fan of Bleed American back in 2001, Oh, yeah. Um, and Clarity, the album that came before that, mm-hmm. and then I think we even I, I even liked Future some the album. I liked Futures quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so I'm not I'm not gonna pan this band and say that I'm just not a fan. I think that they they've done some some interesting things while a bit more radio friendly. Mm-hmm. I think that they're still an interesting band. Um, there is something missing from Integrity Blues. Uh, just something missing from the songwriting. The the sound is super clean and very well performed, but the songwriting is. Fairly simple and somewhat predictable, which would be passable if any of the performances were at all convincing. They're not. This reminds me a lot of Death Cab for Cutie's recent albums and fails for very similar reasons. Yeah, I like this one quite a bit more than you actually. I I, I agree that it's it's nowhere near the, the few albums you mentioned, but I actually like this a lot better than Chase This Light, Invented, or Damages. Uh, you know, it's it's not necessarily a full return to form, but for me, it was actually a step in a in a decent direction sure. that I enjoyed quite a bit more. Down, 
All right, next we've got the new album from Lady Gaga called Joanne. You know, I'm not a Lady Gaga mega fan. I don't know if I'd call myself a little monster, but I will say that I'm someone who is continually intrigued by what she does. And I I actually ended up really liking Art Pop, her previous LP. So when I heard that she was coming out with Joanne, which somehow, I don't know if I live in a box or what, uh, I I didn't really hear that this was being released until like the day that it was released. So I was like, oh, check out the new Lady Gaga album. So this is very different for her. While still clearly being a pop album, it's about as close to singer, songwriter, even country as Gaga has ever gotten. It's a far cry from the synth-driven dance romps of art pop or really anything that came before that out of her catalog. This was produced heavily and co-written by with Mark Ronson. He had a heavy hand in both of those aspects, and, and, and it's kind of nice in a way. He has a way of giving pop music a more authentic feeling in the presentation, making you forget the digitally manufactured nature of the instrumentation by providing a rich mid-range and creating a soundscape that you can actually envision people performing rather than simply pressing play on a MacBook. Uh, that's something that we heard out of his album that came out, uh, you know, I believe, yeah, j- gosh, just early last year, last year in 2015, uh, up, Uptown Funk, that, that had a very similar approach. So, unfortunately, though, while this is a positive quality in the production, I think that Mark Ronson's songwriting touch is actually a detraction, as it doesn't really offer much soul or genuine humanity, which is actually something that Gaga's last couple albums had quite strongly, especially for, for pop music. I also think that Gaga's vocals fit better with her previous styles. Here she can't quite be the powerhouse that she is, and it comes off as unconfident. After I listened to this album a little bit more, I realized that that vocal piece is really the biggest problem. Uh, it, it's just the styling, the way she sings. It's not that her vocals necessarily fit better uh, with her previous albums. It's more that she's just singing these, in my opinion, wrong. I don't think it fits. On the title track, for example, she's putting way too much edge and drama into her performance for such a mellow song, and it rubs me the wrong way. In Perfect Illusion, she opens up way too much, and she sings from the back of her throat, and to me, it just doesn't fit. In contrast, there are some songs that she puts the perfect inflection into, like Ayo and Million Reasons. So it's just not really consistent. It conflicts with the musical style at times, and and the whole sound clashes in those moments, which is a shame because, to me, these songs are actually all right on the whole. So I'm, I'm a little bit mixed on this one. Back in 1999, a band from Illinois called American Football released a record called American Football. And I'm not sure how big that record really got, but it kind of had some underground cult success, I'd yeah. say. And which has grown only grown since the right, album was released. Right. Yeah. Well, a couple of years ago, American Football, you know, these guys had uh, disbanded. I wouldn't even say broken up because it sounds pretty amiable when they when they called it quits yeah. the first time around. They just moved to different cities. 2014 said they're going to get back together, do some shows, and what do you know? We have a second a second American Football record called LP2 or American Football 2 in 2016. These guys are still the kings of the clean, twinkling guitars. There's a lot of good to say about the songwriting and arrangements on this record. The song structures don't get stale, and everything blends really well. However, the dynamic level fall is, is just fairly flat, and all of the instrumentation sounds pretty much the same throughout the record, with a few exceptions like the track Give Me the Gun. While the vocalist's voice still sounds pretty good aesthetically, I don't feel it fits this music very well. For music that's supposed to be emotive, his voice doesn't really emote. The lyrics try to make up for this, but it's just it just creates a disconnect between the lyrics and the way that the lyrics are presented in the vocals. I like that this album is a little back heavy though. The last four tracks are really strong. They're so delicate. Sometimes I forget You're made of wet paper All right, next up we have the album Retribution from, I'm going to butcher this, Tanya Tagak. 
I'm assuming Tagak. I, I hope I'm right about that. That's so, what I would have said. Okay. Well, thanks, Jake. I'm also from Iowa. I was gonna. I don't. I don't know if that makes me feel better, but I guess it kind of. I just does. got your back, buddy. <laughs> Thank. I appreciate BFFs. It, I appreciate it, man. So Tanya is as a, a throat singer is is the style, the vocal style that she has. She's from Canada, and this album is absolutely terrifying. And if you know anything about me. You know anything about Tom Hummer, you know that I love music that scares the crap out of me, and this does. Um, So basically, imagine this style of throat singing uh, over an instrumental backdrop that's to me reminiscent of swans, just this dark soundscape, totally brooding and murderous, and that's what you're listening to here. This gets an A-plus from me for for originality, but it's also a bit of a limited listen due to its natural lack of melody, if that's what you're looking for. I think that what Tanya does with her vocals is absolutely incredible, though. You can tell it's not just random grunts and noises. Everything is deliberate, everything is thought out, and that's what I'm looking for. The layers, the panning, the effects, the use of vocals as a rhythmic device, and also as an intensity builder, it is all spot on. Next, we have John K. Sampson, a Canadian singer-songwriter and folk artist, with his album Winter Wheat. This is a fairly experimental and diverse folk rock release. All I gotta say is Clem Snide, anybody? Yeah. It's folky, but it really relies on some solid pop hooks to get the point across and make the song stick. Some of the folkier tracks remind me of a a lot of Fionn Reagan, uh, both in the vocal presentation and the hand-strummed acoustic guitar. Overall, I really like the simplicity of the presentation here. This isn't a flashy, flashy folk album at all. It's Samson's voice, cleverly crafted acoustic guitar, and intriguing, relatable lyrics that draw you in. I'll admit that this one doesn't really blow me away. Folk music rarely does. But it does make me want to keep listening, and that's something I'd like to celebrate. Next, we've got the new album from Helmet, Dead to the World. Helmet is a great hard rock alternative metal band from the 90s. They put out some classic albums, some really noteworthy ones, especially in the early to mid 90s. I've always enjoyed their brand of hard rock. They keep the instrumentals and structures fairly grounded while remaining experimental. Still, I've always struggled with their vocals a little bit, and here is no different. I think it's going to be an either love it or hate it thing. Uh, they feel a little bit raw to me, and I want with the, with how great the instrumentals are for them to be a little bit more polished. Um, there, there's also a bit more of a straightforward instrumental approach here. So this isn't an album I necessarily see myself coming back to, just because I'm going to want to listen probably to Helmet's earlier stuff. Uh, but it was a fine listen. Next, we have the album Parachutes from Frank Iro and the Patients. This is the former guitarist from My Chemical Romance making punky post-hardcore, and I really like the authentic, raw energy and production that I hear on Parachutes. Uh, What will win you over or turn you off with Parachutes is ultimately the vocals. The vocalist is a is just spastically throwing his screams and power belts out as hard as he absolutely can. The energy is insipid, but I could understand how the the shrillness of his yells could turn some folks off. Overall, though, I thought it was fairly fairly unique, original, and I, I really dug this record. Next up, we have an album from Marching Church called Telling It Like It Is. Marching Church is, is it kind of began as the solo project of the vocalist from the Danish band Ice Age. The gentleman's name, I'm probably going to destroy here, but Elias Bender Ronenfelt. That's how it looks to a simple 
Iowa fellow like myself. So this album is not what you... It doesn't really sound like Ice Age. You get some similarities in the vocal presentation. I like that he keeps that punk edge in his voice, but he switches out those grinding punk instrumentals for this interesting combination of clangy alt rock with this kind of loungy sinister blues vibe it's like if you take some elements of early u2 or the cure and mix it with like tom waits and nick cave i really love the uniqueness of the style here and the songwriting was also good enough to make me come back to it so overall i thought this was a really strong release Next, we have the latest release called Third World Pyramid from the prolific shoegaze and psychedelic band, the Brian Jonestown Massacre. Back in 2012, when Tom and I were doing album reviews, they had an album come out called Offheben, or Offheben. I'm going to call it Offheben because it sounds cooler. Uh, but I, I remember really, really liking that it record. It was great. Really strong album. And I, I mean, this this album, Third World Pyramid, definitely has a similar vibe to Off Even. It has that clangy electric guitar, acoustic drums, harmonica, and nonchalant vocals all just soaked in a pool of reverb. Uh, Third World Pyramid has a lot of southern rock nods in the sound. However, I think that that's the it's the carefully crafted production that makes this album unique. These guys know how to make a cohesive sound using washy production techniques. I didn't find this one to be quite as engaging as Hofheven, but I really enjoyed it overall. And for the last album of our October 2016 wrap-up, we've got Alejandro Escovedo, Burn Something Beautiful. This is just fun southern blues rock. The songwriting reminds me a lot of Tom Petty, uh, but I like that the production is a little dirty. Alejandro has a great persona throughout this album. He's coy and lighthearted, breaking into spoken word bits that create this really vivid imagery. To be honest, this has never been a style that excites me all that much or really makes me feel anything, but I think that he pulls it off very well. Wow, that was a lot of albums, Tom. It was. October was fruitful. We even cut out a number that I know we that did. you at least listened to. Like a to. dozen. <laughs> you, Tom, Tom has this in, insatiable ability to just consume music that I have always envied, and now that I have children, I envy even more. <laughs> Because, you know, being able to escape in the headphones sounds so brilliant sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but just just a prolific month with, with, with honestly, like, a lot of albums that, like, really were just kind of in that, like, 70s range for yeah. me. Kind yeah, of, Kind here. of like the albums, you know, Tom, that, that I'd classify as good, but nothing that blows you away. Nothing that's going to yep. make, like, the best albums of the year list with, like, one or two exceptions here and there. There also wasn't that many bad albums, like, blatantly no, bad albums. No, no, it was just a very middling month. Yeah, middling month, middling on. October, Mm -hmm. just run of the mill, get those albums out there. Yep. Uh, But we have to end with our every month we we pick three albums that we really liked from from the month and one that we hated. So Tom, what were the three albums? The three for me was Fantagrams three. I really liked that one. Uh, I'm also going to go with Kate Tempest, Let Them Eat Chaos, and Tanya Tagak, Retribution. I just thought that those last two were very unique picks. Those are great, Tom. My top three, John K. Sampson's Winter Wheat, Katie Gately's Colors, and Dee Dee Dumbo with Utopia Defeated. That was definitely my favorite album of the month, Utopia Defeated. Now, album you hated. Green Day. Easy. Ugh. I didn't even uh, listen to it. Yeah, I know. I couldn't. A, you I had to avoid out. it. I was. Yeah. <laughs> I had zero desire to listen to any Green Day, let alone their new record, that I, <laughs> which I thought would be shitty. <laughs> <laughs> You're a smart man. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. I still feel guilty, though. I want you to know that. <laughs> I'll make you listen to it someday. Oh, God. Someday, when you least expect it. 
<sighs> like when we're in the car for three hours. <sighs> oh, no, yeah. I, no, I wouldn't do that to myself either. <laughs> so the album that really disappointed me was Jaguar Maz. Every now and then, yeah. I, I mean, I liked Howlin'. I was, I was pretty yeah, was excited great. for another Jaguar Maz album, and it just, it was a it big letdown. Much, I mean, it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't the worst thing ever. It was a middling month again, yeah. but it, it just didn't, it just didn't live up to my expectations. I mean, it, it just was far below my expectations. For honestly. sure. Going to see Caspian this week, Tom. Yeah, that's going to be freaking fun. I'm very Omaha. excited. Got to we got to if you guys remember, we got to interview Joe Vickers, the drummer of Caspian, yeah. uh, the post post rock band Caspian, um, a couple months ago, and and that was a great time. So now they're coming to Omaha. Tom and I are road tripping over, so you know yeah. that we'll be jamming to Caspian on the way over, yeah. and probably have a dorky pick on our Facebook page. <laughs> and if anyone is going to the Omaha Caspian show and you see us there, come say hi. Come say hi. Yeah. We'd love to talk with you. Thank you guys for your continued support and participation with Velocities of Music. Tom and I love all of your comments on our YouTube videos, your Facebook messages, and emails to us. Your participation is what makes Velocities of Music possible. So, as always, thank you for being awesome. I'm Jake. I'm Tom. We are Velocities of Music, moving music discussion forward. (laughs) 